Former Assistant Chief Reginald Cooper and Lieutenant Daryl Clark say they were fired for reporting alleged corruption to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. These former officers say they want to clear their name once and for all. Over the past few decades, they say they've made claims of insurance fraud by the former chief of police, forgery of test documents by a sergeant, a cover-up by the Hall administration of a police chase gone bad, and reporting a hostile workplace environment. Working there was like walking on eggshells because you never knew when they were going to try to discipline you just because of your race. For years, Cooper and Clark claimed the Alexandria Police Department has had a racial divide that was outstanding. If a black officer called in sick, they would send someone to their house yes. to make sure they were sick and that they were at home mm -hmm. and wasn't leaving home that day. Whereas white officers, I've seen incidents where they called in sick and they went deer hunting. They and they mean? came back and laughed and joked about it in roll call with the supervisor and nothing was done to them. They allege the black officer referred for calling in sick was fired. Both claim being called racial slurs and unfair treatment became a norm for black officers in the department, especially those speaking out. We were listed as the color coalition, us four officers that made a complaint. We were singled out because we were speaking out against the treatment that we were receiving from other officers and even administration itself. Cooper was the first African-American assistant chief in the history of APD. Once I got in that position, I quickly learned that they didn't want me involved. The, uh, the chief, the commissioner, and others in power. This would have been the first time four African Americans would hold high-ranking positions. As they started moving up in ranks, they'd hoped to change the department's environment. When we figured that at one point we were going to get to the top yeah. and we would be able to make, change. make changes within the department that would stop all that. But they say the administration was set on diminishing their roles. Basically, I just had the title of an assistant chief. I wasn't allowed to implement or run anything within the department. Bypassing them and going straight to their colleagues. My subordinate would get the information before I get it. Any investigations were started, went through him. I never knew anything. Upon joining APD, they say they wanted to bring transparency to the department. The four officers who allegedly went to authorities for said misconduct and use of excessive force say they went to an attorney to seek guidance. Anyone that's in a position of authority, and they were, that knows some unconstitutional violation has taken place and they don't do anything to report it to law enforcement, uh, if they're supervisors, then they can be held liable. After taking their attorney's advice, they say they became the laughing stock of the department. We started being joked about. We were circumvented through the chain of command. Following filing their complaints to HR, both were called to be interviewed. They wanted to know who did we talk to? And we told them we talked to the FBI. Dara made the statement then, that was a grave mistake. You shouldn't have done that. Both former officers say they believe their fate was sealed the moment they opened their mouths, resulting in the demotion and or termination of the four officers that allegedly reported what they believed was excessive force by a former officer to the FBI. In complaints obtained by ABC 31, Clark alleges the city originally were punishing them for going to the FBI, but then things switched up when they realized the former officers could be protected under the Whistleblower Act. They changed what they were seeking to eliminate or discharge or punish for from being disclosing it to the FBI to uh, looking for other instances, something else that they could find. The complaint alleges Clark was fired from the department for allegedly misusing information systems, but he feels this was retaliation. These reports claiming officers weren't really taking the test. The sergeant in charge was allegedly signing off on them to receive grant money for the department. Both Cooper and Clark claim to have been through numerous chiefs and multiple mayors without ever being investigated. However, under Hall's administration, they feel as though they were being targeted by former Chief Jared King. So to stick with this department from 1988 for 33 years, make it all the way to the assistant chief without any blemishes, and because I reported something to the FBI that I knew was wrong, 
for them to fire me has really been disheartening. Although they say the heat was turned up, the battle is still not over. Both don't seem to regret coming forward. Would it be worth it? If your question is say, would I do it all again? I will do it again. Miranda Thomas, ABC 31 News. That works for you. Greetings and welcome to another powerful edition of the Community Defender Talk Show, one powerful hour of truth dispelling falsehood. I'm your host, Brother Daryl Muhammad, and we're so happy that you have joined our tonight's program. And of course, I just want to say in our, in our lead-in video, uh, it does relate to uh, what we had gone over on last time, uh, where people in the system cannot get justice from the system that they have tried to uphold. And so I want, we wanted to I'll point that out again and to show you the consistent pattern uh, that's going on all around this state and all around uh, the country. I also want to mention, before we introduce our wonderful guest, I wanted to mention uh, Id Mubarak uh, to all of the Muslims who have completed the fast of Ramadan. As you know, um, we are now in what we call Id al-Fitr, which is a feast uh, period of time after our long fast of 30 days. So we are so grateful uh, to God that he has allowed us to make the fast. And for those of you who have participated and been able to make that number, we know that you uh, feel a great sense of accomplishment and that you are more connected uh, to your creator. The, now, moving um, right along with our topic. Now, uh, tonight I want everybody to have an open mind. <clears throat> I want you to Put your thinking caps on because we've had shows like this before, uh, but it's not the usual show that we have. This is to deal with an issue, which is a systemic issue, but to highlight the pain that one person and then their corresponding family are dealing with. And what we are dealing with is a case of... <clears throat> I guess uh, being falsely accused of something that you did not do and then being railroaded through the system and not really being given the relief that you need. And you know that in the state of Louisiana, we have a bunch of cases like this where the evidence doesn't match what the prosecution said what the police said, what all the other people said, nothing matches, and yet you, you, you have these recalcitrant judges that find people guilty with little or no evidence in very high-stakes uh, trials. And so uh, we have a gentleman by the name of Dexter Pounds who was falsely accused. He is in uh, state, the state penitentiary now. And what we want to do is get his story out, okay, we want to show you uh, that this is a human being that should be with his family based upon uh, what we have come up with. Now, I want to introduce to you uh, Sister Sandra, Sandra Duncan, and she comes to us tonight to tell a story that I want everybody to listen to. Because again, I don't just bring anybody on the show. I have, in, in, the, in the, the nearly 22 years that I have done this show, by God's grace, and you know Brother Oscar, who was the co-host of this show for seven years, he and I did this show together every, at that time it was every Saturday. He and I did this show together. He is the brother who actually, who actually had Sister Sandra to get in touch with me so that we can bring this situation to light. So, Please bear with us. Please have an open mind. And at a certain point, we're going to open up for anybody who has any questions to call. But I want you to listen to what you're about to hear and be attentive. And I want to welcome you, Sister Sandra. Yes. Uh, I want to welcome you. And, of course, um, what brings you here tonight, you can kind of state it in your own words. <coughs> we're just having a conversation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi. Thank you. First of all, I just want to thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. So thank you. But yeah, what brings me here tonight is um, as far as back as 1999, mm -hmm. um, a decision was made by a loved one that I know um, 
to just basically spend the night or at his sister's. This is something that's not different, out of the ordinary, mm -hmm. family always together. Um, I just wanted to kind of like title it as what a difference a day could make. You know, that, that's, it? that's the decision <laughs> mm -hmm. that he mm -hmm. made. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the next day he wakes to, I'll pr pretty much say maybe a couple days later, allegations was made against him mm -hmm. of a minor in the house that particular night that mm -hmm. he stayed. Um, he was not even yet arrested. He was approached by a phone call by a detective after the parents decided to, you know, get the cops involved of the allegations, which I would have did the same thing. I'm a woman. I would have mm -hmm. did the same thing for my child. Yes, ma'am. But um, I want to present to everybody, I feel, two victims, the child and the person, okay? Um, she's a minor. Children say things to get out of trouble. She was asked a question about the night before. Truly, maybe some things were going on by another adult. She addressed it, and her words were those accusations, which has now caused him to be in jail mm -hmm. for the rest of his life. Um, I believe that numerous times the child was trying to tell the truth in court, during trial, and I honestly know that she was coerced. Mm -hmm. um, Many times she tried to tell the truth, and they just didn't want to hear. I feel like the state uh, took it and ran because of a history. That makes a difference, too, mm -hmm. in everything, which was his past. Um, well, <clears throat> the thing is, Mr. Mr. Dexter Pound mm -hmm. uh, spent the night uh, at a relative's house, yes. right? He's, he's on a couch. Yes. Right? So a lot of times... Uh, and things can be misconstrued, all right? And this is a very sensitive matter because it involves somebody who was a child at that time. Even though they're no longer a child, this, this, this thing is of a sensitive nature, yes. right? So we have to be careful. The thing is, is that uh, what exactly uh, was the beginning accusation that was made that maybe adults may have run with and so on and so forth? And then what was the reported action or reaction to that of, uh, of Mr. Dexter Pounds? Well, the accusations were, um, well, actually the aunt heard the kids rumbling and playing around at a late hour of the night. And they were addressed, I guess, to be quiet or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, um, as the usual thing. As usual thing. Mm -hmm. And the uh, aunt the next day, the questions were, what were you and the younger sibling doing? And her aroused voice was that Dexter had asked or made her get on top of him. Mm -hmm. Vice versa, vice versa, she was on top of him. Mm -hmm. He addressed her and pushed her off of him. Who wants to believe a, a, an adult over a child? Mm -hmm. So the state took it and they turned it. They didn't want to hear anything that he had to say. You know, um, numerous times this allegation has come from this child before mm. on another loved one, you know. So I just believe that there is something wrong with the child um, mentally and also just to save herself from getting in trouble. So mentally she just didn't want to get in trouble then. What a difference mm. a day can make because she chose to say what she said, mm. never to think that it would go that far. Right. So now fast forward. Uh, the next day, uh, there was a conversation about about it. Mm -hmm. And then the family got the police involved. Yes. And then the state takes it. And you were sharing some crazy things that went on at the supposed trial. I believe I believe he was denied um, a jury trial. Yes, um, several times they come to Dexter with uh, the choice of a plea bargain of 10 years. Mm -hmm. If you are innocent, you're not going to bend, you're not going to bow to say what they want you to say. Mm -hmm. He said no. This carried on several visits, several visits. He would not bow down to the 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, 
Then they forced him into a judge trial. No discussions, no witnesses. And a, and a public defender. With a public defender. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I do believe that they worked together. It was nothing in the interest of proving that Dexter had did it. It's just that they got tired of dealing with Dexter saying, I'm not going to take it. And they wanted it over. Mm -hmm. So in order to make it over is to make it look like it was true after that. So um, the indecent part of it all is that they put the mother out, which would witness what was going on. They put the alleged aunt that received the whole information first, she never took the stand to witness anything. They put her out in the lobby to make their decision mm -hmm. with the minor in there by herself. Okay. Um, then they come up with the decision of life. Life plus 15 years, it's pretty harsh without proving it totally. Well, here's, here's the, the, the thing with, with a lot of this stuff, okay? Now, the charge that he was convicted of, and, and, and again, it, it, you're talking about a bench trial from a judge who reportedly used the N-word at restaurant. I think it was Judge Irwin or Irvin who, Judge later, Irwin. who, who, later, who later retired rather than to face the music. Yes. So you already got somebody uh, with some significantly compromised judgment being a judge. So it's a situation where you got a public defender who's not defending anything. No. And you have a little girl who's being led. And then when she doesn't say the things that they want her to say, they kind of lead her with no objection from the defense counsel. Right. And then you got a judge that just simply rubber stamps. And we're talking about aggravated rape. Yes. Okay. That, that particular conviction carries a mandatory life sentence. There's only one sentence that it carries. So aggravated rape, and of course you and I went over the aggravating factors on, on last night. That statute has six aggregate, aggravating factors that, that could make it aggravated rape. And one is somebody under 13 or somebody over 65 that would aggravate the circumstances and then bring you into a mandatory life situation. Now, here's the thing. They allege that he raped her, yes. but according to what, you, what we discussed, there was no rape kit or anything Not at all. that would... So it's based upon coerced testimony of a person who was eight years old and a, and a forced bench trial where he's standing there with co-counsel just sitting there looking. Mm -hmm not really counseling anything. So this is the scene that occurred. Now, according to what, what, what we learned, excuse me, he had a, an ad, an, I guess an adversarial history with the DA who was dealing with his case, right? Yes. <clears throat> so she knew him, excuse me, and she wanted, you know, that, 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 that there seems to have been some something vindictive going on. Yes. Now, the thing is, when, when we're dealing with our children, the safety of our children, and, and keep in mind, uh, I'm not going to bring anybody on here because, see, you know, I got grandchildren. Um, I got six grown children. Uh, and <clears throat> my children who grew up with me, I have one of them who grew up in my house, so she's here now. So she, she understands how I, how I feel yes. about anybody abusing a baby. Yes. Okay. That that's a no no. I'm 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 I don't I'm not even one that's for uh, anything but 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 one one penalty when when it comes to that. Yes. But in this particular situation, <clears throat> mm -hmm. with no evidence, uh, really, and coerced testimony of an eight year old with everybody else kicked out of the courtroom, and then a rubber stamp by a racist judge of whatever the prosecution wants. Now this guy goes from uh, being, you know, at home with his family to all of a sudden looking at life in prison without the benefit of parole um, or, or, um, or parole or suspension of sentence. Yes. 
So it's a, it's it's that kind of scenario. Now, you were saying, as we as we talked yesterday, uh, what did the doctor who examined the, the young lady, who was the expert witness called by the state, what did he have to say? His words were um, that her hemen was not fractured, and he had no reason to do a rape kit because. He doesn't believe that basically she was raped. He had no need for it. He didn't see a need for it. So now, the state's own witness didn't believe, because every time there's a rape, a rape kit is necessary. So the expert who examined the young girl did not believe that a rape kit was necessary and said that there was an intact and, and I know this is sensitive, hymen, yes. which is the covering over the vaginal opening. We have to deal with these issues forthrightly. Yes. That covering that is there prior to uh, a person having intercourse. And when intercourse occurs, that hymen is broken. Yes. Okay, that's the way it, it, you know, when I was in sexual education in, in the 10th grade, that's the way they explained yes. it to me. And if anybody, if I'm wrong about it, somebody can call in and let me know. But the hymen is not going to be there if if you are raped or if you are penetrated in any way. That hymen is gonna is gonna be gone. So the state's own witness testified to the presence of a hymen, which excludes the sexual contact yes. that the state alleges occurred. Yes. Okay. So that's. I wanted to make sure that that was out there, yes. so that they, so that the people understand how this gentleman was railroaded. Now, and I and I know we're still working on uh, this case. We want our goal is to get this falsely accused brother out. Now, again, I am a person that I don't believe an innocent person should be in jail. Okay. I don't believe children should ever be abused. I don't believe women should ever be abused. I don't believe anybody should be exploited. Uh, and and, and my, my children could tell you that I, I'm, you know, Brother Daryl is crazy, okay, <laughs> when it comes to my babies, all right? They already know that all they got to do is call me and, and his own. The thing is, though, an innocent person being accused, and, and, and we have a history where people have spent decades in jail, yes. even with adults, and the adult after 30 years, while they're on their deathbed dying from cancer, says he didn't do it. And, and if the only thing you have is the coerced testimony of, a, of an eight-year-old child who is also a victim of the state, because yes. this child is a victim as well, because they're being used as an instrument against their relative. Yes. You see? And so they're a victim because they're being used to destroy the one thing we all have been able to count on, and that's our family. It's family. You yes. see? So go ahead, Queen. Yes. Um, to piggyback on family, I want everyone to know that Dexter has six children. Mm -hmm. He also has 14 grandchildren that he has never met before. It is, to me, fair to give him a chance at life and be with his family. She has her family. You have your family. Let's take an act in getting this back into court so that he can have the remainder of his life with his family. June of this year, 2021, will be 21 years that Dexter has been divided from his family. I do understand that it's very hard. I am taking the, ch the time to protect her name because I want you to know that I want to lift this burden. I want to help you lift this burden that you have been divided and sleeping at night thinking that people don't love you and trying to deprive their love from you. I love you and he yet still loves you. The issue is the state needs to do their job and get this back into the courts to see this man home to his family. Right, and, and, and of course I think if we investigate this a little further we'll be able to uncover some uh, procedural problems. 
And from what I've been able to see, this case has a number of serious, serious problems. That uh, And perhaps it has some untested uh, evidence that, that could be looked at such that we could ascertain the truth. Yes. Now, you, from what they, they were talking about, okay, because they, they, they didn't get anything off of uh, Dexter, but there was a talk about a fiber or something. Can you explain that? Um, or, or, or is there any, even any explanation for it? Well, the question was where did they get it from because the young child pursued to school the next day. This was days afterwards that they mm. come up and say that they had this piece of fabric. They had a pair of panties that we don't know who they could have been for um, and also some blood samples um, from an inside of the evidence container or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, Dexter says that he was only swabbed once and that was for paternal reasons. So we're wanting to know where did you get the DNA from? Mm -hmm. um, he didn't go there. So where did you get the DNA from? So with respect to this case, okay, he was now his DNA was never tested for this case such that it could match anything. No. I want you to check that out. His DNA was not tested or taken for this particular case where DNA is crucial. And they didn't even take it for this case, but yet were trying to admit things into evidence that they had not done a genetic match on. Interesting. Yes. And, and I just want the viewing audience to, to, to check that out and to see why it is that for years and years we have gone so hard on this system. Now this brother needs justice. He needs a fair trial. Okay? Maybe it could maybe maybe they could they could retry uh, the case if they if they want to. But the thing about the state of Louisiana is that when you make a motion to have something tested that is a part of the evidence of a of a case, mm -hmm. the prosecution will often file a motion to block you testing a particular item. There was a belt that needed to be tested. A person was in jail. And I'm thinking it was 11 or 13 years that the state blocked the test from occurring. It was actually in, in the Orleans Parish. And they blocked the state from testing a belt. And when they finally tested, the guy was out 30 days later. So the, the, the point is, is that the, the, the state will try to block the truth very often uh, from happening. Now, uh, of course, there's going to be more information forthcoming on this case as we kind of uh, open it up and, and investigate it more. But uh, this thing, this case is very shaky, and, and really there's little or no case to be had. You're talking about coerced testimony where the child was asked questions and according to the transcript repeatedly said, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And then led into saying something, well, didn't this happen? You know, and those kind of things. And then when you have co-counsel, when you have um, the counsel for the defendant that doesn't say I object, counsel is leading the witness. That's all it takes. You're leading the witness. Objection, right? Objection. That's all it takes is for somebody to object mm -hmm. to those things, then that gets in the record, right? Mm -hmm. And be because, because it doesn't appear to me that this was the child's actual testimony. Because when you lock everybody out, you got the judge, the, uh, the public defender, mm -hmm. which is a, a, a co-prosecutor sometimes, and then you have the prosecutor, all of these people working together for the demise of a person who might be uh, practically indigent. Because if you don't have money in this system, right. you can literally be railroaded right. and your life taken. And matter of fact, a friend, a friend of the family, um, uh, the matter of fact, that the sister has actually written a book about her experience. She um, was, uh, had drugs planted on her and through the habitual offender rule, she was given a 30-year sentence. 
and she was able to, to get out of it uh, later on. Uh, but the, the thing about it is they put 30 years on her. And so a lot of times we think, well, why would, why would they do that? They do it all the time. Uh, why would they do that? Um, that's, that's not really for, for me to answer. But what I believe is that, is that a lot of times you're not dealing with people that actually have human feeling. You, you're dealing with people whose yes. joy it is to see the suffering of, of poor people. People say, that's crazy. No, these people are not, well, they're trying to keep us safe. Uh, no, you don't keep us safe by putting innocent people in jail. You don't keep us safe by spending money to incarcerate somebody that doesn't need to be incarcerated. You don't keep us safe by, dis by dividing and destroying families based upon a false accusation. And I'm going to tell you, you can blow up anything with a little, a little girl. Somebody eight years old, you can totally manipulate that situation. Uh, and, 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 of course, we've had numerous people that have grown up, gotten on their own, some of them all the way in college, and they want to say, look, uh, my uncle is in jail. He ain't did it. They, 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 they got me in the, in the questioning room and they made me say it and this, that, and the other. And once they grow up sometimes, yeah. they'll recant their story. You follow me? Yeah. And the other thing is that when somebody is eight years old, they're not even at an age where they can be charged with anything. Okay, when you're seven or eight years old, I don't even think you can be charged with it. I don't think that, I think, I think that, that, that you can be charged starting at maybe nine. So you're looking at something that's not even. And then if she's, she's coerced, there's no way yeah, that tried. recanting a false story that she can literally uh, be hurt or what have you. What we need to do is to right this wrong, to right this wrong. And if we can, if whatever we can do to right this wrong is what, what we need to do. Because something was supposed to happen. A rape was supposed to have happened. And... There's no evidence of any sexual contact whatsoever, right? So apparently, the child was playing, and then she was told she jumps up on somebody, an adult, and the adult rightly tells her to get off him. Mm -hmm. Children, a lot of times when you're laying down, they jump all over you, mm -hmm. right? Little boys, little girls, they just dive on you, mm -hmm. right? So if you're laying a certain way and a child just jumps on you, you say, hey, get off me. Mm -hmm. Okay, but then depending on how it happens later, that thing can be twisted to say anything and to go in any kind of direction. And without any real evidence, why would you put somebody in jail for the rest of their life based upon a child really just jumping on top of somebody as children do? Right? Yeah. Just... It, Playing. Somebody two years old jumps on you. All of a sudden, you know, he, he's lo looking for his pacifier. He jumps on you. Next thing you know, you're doing, you're doing life in prison in Angola for something that never happened. Yes. And so it, it, it can't be this easy to take somebody's life in a, in a, in a just and civil society. And, and, this, this, and that's, that's why when, when I talk with you, your, your story resonated with me. You know, I mean, because it was like, really? And, and we're, we're going to get more information because there's more stuff that's, co that's, that's coming out that we may, we may update uh, everybody on this story. But uh, I wanted you to look at the gentleman. Yes. He's a human being. He's in there, railroaded with no real evidence. Coerced testimony of an eight-year-old with all these adults. Now... You mentioned to me that subsequent to this prosecution, there was some sort of material gain. Different things happened that indicated that there was something else going on. Can you can you share that with, with the uh, viewing audience? Yes. Um, I have reasons to believe that they um, did some type of robbery to the mother after they told her that she didn't need to be at court that particular day mm -hmm. and to be set aside. Um, the family was a little less fortunate during that time. Everyone's young. And she was offered um, a different disposition as uh, where she lived. So they offered a, a home. 
um, helped her get into a nice house, matter of fact. And um, this is what I'm hopefully be able to come back with mm -hmm. to prove it in the paperwork that we're trying to get, mm -hmm. that they helped her get into a home right around the time that he was convicted. Hmm. So, brob it's robbery. Interesting. And so to, to settle everything, you, um, I guess you can make somebody feel as though you're on their side and you kind of settle everything with, with, with material acquisition and that kind of calms the situation down. So that's what, what you suspect is going on. Yes. Okay. And, and as, you, as you continue to do your investigation, which I know you're going to do, um, we, we, wanna, we would like at some point to update uh, everybody on uh, this case uh, with Dexter Pounds. His name is Dexter Pounds. Yes. All right. Dexter Pounds. And he is, he is serving a life sentence uh, for, based upon coerced testimony. The doctor who examined the girl who was supposedly raped said that uh, there was no hymenial damage. Hymen intact. And there's another case where a guy was supposed to have brutally raped two white girls. And the doctor's report when they went to the doctor after the rape was supposed to have happened, he supposedly brutally raped the two girls, that both of them had intact hymens after a rape while he was doing, I think he'd been in there for at least 20-something years mm -hmm. by that, and he had just gotten it, and he was trying to get some relief. But you're talking about people being raped with intact hymens. Okay, intact hymens, yet they were raped. And what I'm saying is, this is not plausible. And I think that the court would have to recognize something different happened than what's being alleged. At least that. At least that. Something different happened than what is alleged. And like I said, we all, in this era of time, we have to be very, very careful. We have to be careful that we protect our children, okay, which, you know, apparently the Catholic Church hadn't done, you know, because this guy's in jail. But the Catholic priests who have literally done aggravated rape of boys, they are, uh, you know, you can see them at Starbucks, mm -hmm. okay, uh, having a, a mocha frappuccino or something. So we got to find out what the heck is going on with, with, with this system. Now, uh, we, 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 we want to protect our children, and at the same time, we want to make sure that we also protect the innocent. Yes. And I believe that with common sense, well, I, I can't, shouldn't say common sense, because common sense is not that common. common. <laughs> but I will say with, 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 with the right kind of mindset, I believe we can walk that balance. I'll go ahead and call you on the air with the community defender. Uh, yes, another very enlightening program. Uh, my heart go out to the family, uh, and I wanted to say just you just keep on fighting. I uh, would like to find out what it is that you want us to try to do uh, back here. And if you kn know anything about Louisiana, uh, uh -huh. this, this state is one of the most racist states in existence. These low-life dogs, and that's what they are, because I can't really call them the no-good bastards that they actually are. But these low-life dogs do all kind of things to our people. Uh, the Angola Three, they served some 30-something years in solitary confinement, even when the federal judge told them to release uh, them. They, they did what they wanted to do. And uh, I just wanted to say that... Um, uh, anything that we could do on our behalf, um, Brother Jay, myself, we, we do radio also. Uh, we would love for you to come on and, and, and state the case, but uh, you, it, it's more than that that we have to do. And we have to call them, have pictures of them, so you could see who these animals are. And uh, uh, that's my comment. Uh, thank you so much, and please continue to keep up the fight because yes. our people need it. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, um, uh, you know, I think I think she she said a mouthful with that. You you're gonna have to. And when we talked on yesterday, 
I told you that you were embarking upon a fight. Yes. Uh, and as I said to you before, you, you, it was either 11 or 13 years to get a belt tested to see if the DNA matched the defendant. The belt was sitting in the evidence room for 13 years. And the prosecution fought the testing of the belt. So anything that they believe is going to over, it's not about finding the truth. It's about preserving the conviction that they got no matter how they got it. Yeah. And you got to understand that that's the mindset that you're dealing with. Yes. So as you move forward in this situation, okay, and as, as we do what we can to, to assist in getting the word out, yes. what's, what's, gonna, what's ultimately going to have to happen is that, 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 that there's going to have to be, some of these things are going to have to be tested, looked at, and then, of course, we're going to have to go back and, and revisit uh, some other things as well, <coughs> other persons, to see if we can right this wrong. Yes. But there have been times when a victim, or an alleged victim, recants, and the state still tries to keep them from getting a new trial. So what I'm saying is, you, 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 you know, we are dealing with, as the caller said, a demonic mind. Yes. We're not dealing with a human loving people, people who love and care and are concerned for the well-being of the community. No, yes. because, because, again, these Catholic priests, dozens of them so-called credibly accused, are walking around with no charges. And we know that the, that the people they victimized were under 13, which is what? An aggravating factor yes. for the statute, right? Title, title 14, section 42. You have six aggravating factors. None of these priests are serving life in prison for what the Catholic Church and the community knows that they did. But they want to isolate this brother yes. <laughs> and railroad him with a bench trial for a person who slings, who slung the N-word around a restaurant, allegedly, and before he could face the music, he goes on ahead and retires rather than face the music and actually get either disbarred or uh, get taken off the bench. Go ahead, I'll call you on the air the Community Defender. You have a question for our guest? Good evening, Brother Darren. Good evening, uh, Sister Duncan. Hey, look here. You know, as we know, we're always going to have clan justice, you know. Yes, they give you a public defender, which is a public pretender, because <laughs> he pretends he's going to defend you and never defend you in the proper way that uh, he went to school to be a part of. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems like uh, once they get educated, and Brother Darrell, you know, I know you're an attorney, and you're well-educated, and you're not going to go in there pretending to be an attorney. You're going to go in there and defend your law degree like you went to school to, be, uh, to represent the people. So this is all I'm saying. We got a lot of public pretenders. We got a lot of clan justice that's still going on in the courts, you know. So... We got to understand that, and we got to make sure that we're going to stand up for what we're all about. Because if we don't stand up for ourselves, nobody else is going to stand up with us. Thank you, Brother Darrell, for all that you bring to the airwave, and thank you, Sister Sandra, yes. for uh, you. you know bringing what is concerned and should be concerned to all of us, because we're all one step away. Yes. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And, and of course, we are, we, we are not lost on the absolute fact that there are probably dozens of Dexter Pounds uh, in, in custody all over America. You know, it, dozens of them in, in Louisiana, but all over America. And we wanted to show you some graphics of the brother so that you would know uh, that this is a person. You know, yeah, let, let's go ahead on and put, up, put a face to it. Yes. And of course... Um, we, you know, and of course you, you, you have visited uh, the brother, right? Yes. And your relationship, and, and, and just go ahead and lay out for the viewing of what your relationship is with the brother. 
Um, my relationship with him is uh, I have a son that at the time that he had his dad ripped from him was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. um, he's now, um, same thing, he just wants his dad home. Um, so I have his second oldest son. So, uh, and that 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 says says a, a a lot, and of course you just you just want justice in in the case. Yes. Right? And so you're you're pursuing justice now. Who who's this? This is his mother. This is his mother. Okay. She wrote numerous times with me to Angola. Mm -hmm. She uh, passed and transitioned over with this still unsolved. I want to do this for you, Miss Carolyn. Mm -hmm. For all the times that we rode to Angola. I want to do this and let you know that I've never stopped, and I'm gonna do this for you. Absolutely, and I mean just and just you know I want I want people to know and to see what this is, that this is a life that is that has been snatched away unjustly from uh, someone, and for you to be out there on that farm, in the middle of nowhere, down that long road, uh -huh. you understand. And by the way, uh, I've tried the past two times I've tried to get into Angola. Uh, I've been denied entry, right? Probably the past three times. And what they what they use against me? Because myself and, and brother Derek, we went in there. Everything went 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 really really well. I went went there before, but and and everything went went well. The thing that they use is y'all know that I'm a, I'm a Muslim. And I changed my name legally to Muhammad. But the first time I went down to Angola, I had not changed my name yet. So I changed it to that. They keep bringing up how the name that they had on file doesn't match the current, the current name. But the decree says, Daryl Cornell Muhammad shall be his true and lawful name from this date. It tells you that the state of Louisiana has decreed that my name is another name. So uh, I don't know how that, that kind of mistake should be made because all state agencies are under an obligation to obey the court orders of all of the, of the state. So if the, if the 19th Judicial District under uh, Wilson Fields decreed that my name should no longer be Daryl Cornell Ward and now be Daryl Cornell Muhammad, then you would think that the people in Angola would know and understand that. So, but apparently, I drive out there, drive out there for about a half hour, forty-five minutes to get out there, and and I get I get turned around because I've I've tried to go in, and just to give a word, you understand, to uh, lift up the spirit and to help people to make changes in their lives yes. uh, with a word because the word of God is transforming. And that's all we, we, we've attempted to do is to get people engaged in that study so that upon their release, they will be engaged in a higher level of living because they've had a higher level of thinking. And that's, that, that's what, we, what we've tried to bring. But they blocked us even from, from, uh, from going in. Yes. And it's been, I thought it's been the past three times. I've, I've driven out there three times and been turned away. So hopefully we can, we can get that rectified, by the way. I know that's a sidebar, but I want to get in there. And, and it would be nice if I could go there and at least while, until we win the fight, I could talk to Dexter. Yes. <laughs> you understand? I could yes. say, hey, bro, we had a show, man, dealing with you, man. We're fighting to get you out, yes. to, to bring that light to him. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. It, would be, it would be really, really wonderful if we can do that. And, Brother Director, if you could edit this and let's get this on YouTube ASAP so that we can spread it to as many people as possible. Because once we put this thing on the World Wide Web, we want it to go everywhere so, so that people know that Dexter Pounds was falsely accused, an innocent man, a man who, who, who instead of being indecent with a, with a child who really didn't know, was a decent person and separated himself from any sort of uh, contact with the child that would be improper. If you ask me, he's a good man. If you ask me, he's a good person. If you ask me, if anything, he prevented any semblance of impropriety from occurring by his actions. I think he took the right actions. And I just think that 
a lot of times when you have these very vindictive demons who love to see people suffer, a lot of times uh, they can twist it a, a, a certain way. And when four or five people get around an eight-year-old, we can, and let's just be honest, we can damn them make that eight-year-old say anything we want them to say. Okay? We can give them candy. I mean, how, how, do, how, do, how do people lure children? They give them candy. You want some cookies. Or they be nice to them. Now, come on. Yeah. And, and I, I'm telling you, most eight-year-olds, you can damn near get them to say anything. You, you get two police officers and two prosecutors around an eight-year-old, you can come up with anything. You've got to have other evidence. Yes. And especially when you're leading the witness and the child is steadily saying, I don't know, I don't know. Yes. I don't know, I don't know. Well, hold on for a second. You're saying you don't know, but this guy's, and for them to, and I'm going to say this, for them to go to trial when they're still discussing a plea bargain in such a high stakes trial without any kind of preparation, no preparation. No expert witness of your own. No cross-examination no. of the expert witness called by the state. Nothing. No. No. That is crazy. That is insane. And uh, for, for a person to have a borrowed number and, 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 and do it, and, and I'm going to tell you, one, one, of the, one of the guys at Southern said to me that you got a lot of lawyers but very few good ones. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you don't question everything with the arrest, with everything that they're doing, preliminary examination, you do all of that. And then if you, if you haven't done your, your, your due diligence, then he, he, say, he said, you're a chicken crap lawyer. And he didn't say the word crap, but that's what he said. And, and that, that, that it appears that that's what the deal is. And all of the drunks and alcoholics... <laughs> Mm -hmm. A lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them get sent to the public defender's office. And those who do a good job of defending their clients are normally taken out of the public defender's yeah. office and offered more money Elsewhere. in mm -hmm. the prosecutor's office. Yeah. You know, because I, I mean, I, I, got, I got a frat brother who was a public defender. He was doing a good job, and they moved him to the prosecutor's side. You see? Good brother, but they moved him because he was very sharp. And they, they get the best talent and bring it over there. Wow. You understand? Yeah. So it, it, the, the, the scales are, are stacked against us a lot of times, particularly when, when we're poor. Particularly. When, yes. Particularly when you're poor and black in the state of Louisiana. Yeah. And as, as, as I heard a law professor say years ago, he said, if you are accused of murder, he said, Daryl, if a man is accused of murder in the state of Louisiana, whether he was in town or not, if he does not have a hundred thousand dollars, he's got real problems. He he told me that. He said if he doesn't have a hundred thousand dollars, he's got real problems, whether he was in state or not at the time of the murder. Mm, mm. And that's a law professor telling me that. Mm. <laughs> it just yeah. goes to show you. But what we're gonna do, sister, is this is this is of course uh, the beginning stages of a fight, as uh, the caller called in and said don't give up they, they're going to do everything the system is going to do everything it can to discourage you which is why so many years of so many people have been lost I want to of course commend you on your courage it's not easy to come on uh, television and, and show your face and state your case but you 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 know by God's grace you were able to do that and and I, I just want to come in because you, you know not every day you're on you're on television, right. but you were willing to come here and talk about it for a brother. And so this and what and what I want to say also is that when when it comes to black male female relationships, and I want to say this to black men, that our sisters love us, and many of them will fight for us even when we have nothing. And that's why I think that we should be, we should look at our sisters with the kind of love that they're due. We should look at our sisters and see them the way God sees them as our true helpers in this life. Our sisters are our real helpers. And, we, and, and that's one lesson all of us need to take from that. I want to thank you for, for coming. Do you have any closing remarks? I just want to bring it back to what a day 
what a difference a day can make because mm -hmm. on this day you hear that a voice will shake the grounds once again for Dexter Pounds. I want to also be able to shake the grounds for the ones that fear of what may happen. But I'm like, what can happen? They say it's the worst, but this day can make a difference. And I do want to thank you guys. Absolutely. And of course, we want we want to thank you. And uh, how how long do we do we have left, brother director? Got about it, huh? Three minutes. Okay, it's seven fifty-five. We we got three minutes, or we got one. Okay, all right. I want to, of course, thank thank you all for tuning into the Community Defender Talk Show. We're going to be back with more uh, content for you. Uh, we want to thank our guest, uh, Sister Sandra Duncan, for coming out and to, for sharing her story. Keep that name in your prayers. Dexter Pounds, Dexter Pounds, Dexter yes. Pounds. When you go to church and the altar call is made, mention yes. that brother in your prayers. Yes. And let's help, let's do what we can to help this sister uh, keep up the fight. May God bless you as your brother greets you in peace. Assalamu alaikum. And we look forward.